you don't belong here. That is what my mind used to tell me. And it was a lie. But before my trauma was healed, I used to feel like an unwelcome outsider just about everywhere I went. Do you have this? You start out like with a feeling of hope that that not belonging feeling is caused by, you know, a bad group, a bad person or like snobby people. So you try again. You try to be part of a new group and you try to fit in and belong. But then sooner or later, something in you gets triggered and the same feeling takes over and you feel like you have no choice but to get away from the group. You don't belong here. That is one of eight lies that childhood trauma tries to tell you. And these are forms of trauma-driven thinking. And we know now that these very thoughts are common. They're a totally normal part of complex PTSD. And if you grew up with neglect and abuse, you might relate to what I'm saying. It is such a primal need, right? To be part of the tribe, to be recognized and included, for people to get you. And that's why the belief that we don't belong anywhere is one of the most painful lies that your trauma tells you. It helps if you can just name it. When you name it, you can get a little distance from it. It's like, could it be true that I don't belong here? Hold on. When you name it, you can begin to separate and see what you're saying and realize that your CPTSD is doing some thinking for you and it's very distorted. So that was number one. Let's go over the other seven lies. And just in case you're believing any of these lies right now, I want to help you break the spell and come back to what's real. Okay. So the second lie is you are permanently damaged by your trauma and therefore you're never going to get a fair shot at life. Do you ever feel like that? Yes, you do. <laughs> Lots of people feel that way, not just traumatized people. If you grew up uh, with violence going on in the house, with alcoholism and drug addiction, so often that stuff goes along with poverty and shame and this feeling that you have to separate from everybody and you have to hide what's going on at home. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like if you think that you're so damaged that you're never going to get a fair shot, it starts to echo across all these like actual experiences where you didn't get a fair shot. Like it wasn't fair that you didn't get to be safe when you were a kid. And it wasn't fair that your parents didn't just like back you a hundred percent and believe in you and, and support you in trying to grow up and become yourself. Like if they antagonize that for you, how are you going to come to believe that you do have a fair shot, that the world is your oyster? This kind of like insidious lie, it, it gets in there really deep and it can take a lot of work to root it out that you are permanently damaged, which you're not. It certainly causes lasting symptoms. And I'm saying you can heal symptoms and you may never be in mint condition, like how you would have been if, if nothing had ever happened, but that's literally impossible. That's like magical thinking to think that there was a hypothetical you where nothing bad ever happened. You are not permanently damaged. The damage that you're having now is mostly not permanent. You can heal, you can make progress. And actually if you could take this, there are certain little like bad threads, of the CPTSD that show up in your, in your, in the way you see the world and in the way you express yourself. If you could change just one or two of those, it could make a profound difference. It could start to make it a lot easier to change the other ones. So let's just take that lie that you're permanently damaged, that you can never get a fair shot. And let's just chuck it out of here. You're going to face a lot of obstacles in your life, but when you face them with some tools to start healing your trauma, it can be a whole different experience than what you've had in the past. All right. So hang in there. All right. Third lie we got to get rid of is that people are out to get you. That's almost never true. And I have to say that out loud because that's one of the lies that really got in there with me is a belief that people actually want the worst for me. When people are kind, they, um, they don't really mean it, that it's self-interested or when they're indifferent, it's because they're against me. One of the biggest things I learned, I went back to a high school reunion some years ago. And when I was in high school, I was kind of like an oddball. I was, I, I was a punk kid. I had the perception that all the popular people, all the preppy kids, all the ones who appeared to me to have it all made, that they had this happy little world and that they didn't want me in it. And by some fluke, like when Facebook came out, I ended up friends with one of the most beautiful and popular girls from my high school. 
which was very unlikely. She was beautiful, she was popular, but once we were both adults, we were just women, you know, we became friends. And I made the bold move and I flew to her city and spent the weekend with her one time and we had a really great time. She was so kind, she made all these gifts for me and she welcomed me and she was so kind and we spent long hours talking. And first of all, I found out that her high school experience wasn't all perfect. In fact, it was quite traumatic. It may have been um, as bad and in some ways worse than what I had been through. And of course, I had just thought I was the only kid in the world who was going through anything. But also, I, she said, you remember those parties we used to have out in the Arroyo? And I said, no, I, I was never invited to those parties. You know, I don't know if you realize this, but I was never included or, or anything. And she said, really? Because we all thought you were really cool and funny and nice, but you always just kind of walked on by. You wouldn't even talk to anybody. I had my eyes opened that there actually was like love and friendship around me, but I couldn't see it yet. I couldn't see it yet because my trauma was telling me this lie that people were out to get me. All right, the fourth lie we got to get rid of is that you better not be too picky and you better just take whatever comes along because it's probably all you're going to get. I think it is like a particular lie that's very common with people who were neglected and it's really bad and if it gets into your romantic relationships, man, are you going to have a life of trouble. Of course you need to be picky about who you get together with. And the thing that you learn as you have relationships and when you're traumatized and you're working on it and you're working on it and you're trying to get better is that a lot of the trouble starts in the choice you make. And you've probably seen, you know, I have I have a whole course on dating where I go into this in depth about the, the kind of thinking that leads to bonding with somebody who isn't even who you wanted. Like, you know getting into the relationship, this isn't the one, this isn't somebody that you really respect, but you get all attached to them that when you're neglected, you have that attachment wound and you're carrying it around. It's like this giant like super glue thing that just like globs on to people. It doesn't just do it randomly. And I'll be honest with you, what, what causes that bonding to happen real fast without any kind of like foresight is casual sex, all right? But if you're going in and bonding with people before you even know them, there's almost always this period of time where you sort of are coming out of it going, whoa, what have I done? I don't even like this person. But if you have a fear of abandonment, you just hang out in that relationship anyway. You just stay and stay and stay and stay and then like complain and resent and try to change them until finally somebody leaves. And if you have abandonment trauma, it's probably going to be them. And that's the embarrassing thing. It's like you never even like them and you're sitting there like, ah, I got dumped. And um, I'm laughing now, right? But it's really painful when it's happening. So you do get to be choosy. Of course you need to choose somebody who you think really highly of. There will be more. And as you heal some of the prickly behaviors and the strange like running away from relationships or glomming on too fast, all of those things, those have all been getting in the way of, of developing like a great relationship with the people who come along. When all those symptoms are calmed, when your triggers are calmed, you're going to find that you're a lot more attractive than you used to think. And people are going to take an interest in you. You being yourself without all that fear and kind of push, pull, you doing that can be really sexy to people. So don't ever fear. You will have more chances in healing. And I don't care how old you are. I've talked about my friend Gladys here. She died a few years ago. She was this wonderful person in my life. She was a friend's mom and she lived up the street and she looked out for me and she taught me to knit and she taught me to cook and she took me to summer camp and she let me take piano lessons at her house because I didn't have, you know, that kind of means at my house. She was this really good person in my life, but she had this really awful husband and I didn't like him and I didn't feel safe around him. And I reconnected with her some years before she died and she had this incredible news that she had been widowed some years back and she had gotten together with a guy that she had known for a long time and it ended up being the most incredible, beautiful relationship of her life. And she said she was sorry she stayed so long in this bad relation, this bad marriage with her husband and that the five years she had with her husband before he passed away at the age of 90, those years were by far the happiest years of her life. And she was, she was in her 80s. So never think it's too late when you become free with yourself and you have less fear, less resentment, less push, less pull, and more joy, you're going to be able to attract and be attracted to someone who totally loves you as you are. 
So we're gonna get rid of that lie. And then we're gonna get rid of another lie. And that they kind of go together. And this one, I never hear it talked about, but I sure have it myself. And I'm gonna guess that a lot of you have it. And it's this lie that everything is temporary. Like you can never really like commit and choose the house you really want or have the friends you really want or buy the jacket that you really like. You can't do that. That sometime in the future, you're gonna be in your real life and you'll be able to get the thing you really want. But right now you just get some temporary thing that doesn't really fit and you don't really like it and it doesn't really reflect you. Am I the only one who has that? Everything is temporary. And so part of my healing is to start to understand and experience that as much as I felt like people have let me down in terms of their commitment to me, like my, my mother, um, you know, my first husband, uh, people I dated, certain friends, that people had let me down in their commitment to me. I had never really made a commitment to anything. I never really committed to a person, a friend, a job. You know, I always had kind of like one foot out the door. I always kept myself sort of hold, held apart from that. And I think that is coming from a similar place as the lie that I don't belong. But there's like this thinking like that somewhere out there, there's this place where I do belong and then I can buy the jacket and I'll find the house. And I'm learning like no time like the present. You might as well have something you like right now. And anyway, you know, one day that whatever jacket you have, it's going to wear out and you're going to get another jacket and that one can suit you on that day. So we begin to make commitments and that's what counters that lie. All right. You want to get rid of another lie? Here's one for you. Your negative experiences prove that your fears are true. <laughs> so you go through life thinking, you know what? I think that secretly, I'm really unlovable. I think that I'm really like not even like other people. And if anybody knew who I really was, they wouldn't even want to be with me. Then out of that place, when that lie is driving you, who do you get together with? You get together with like whoever you get together with temporary person. And then guess what? They don't accept you. They don't accept you. You haven't shown who you really are. You haven't been like kind of like vibrating and shining at the personality you actually have. Maybe you people please, or maybe you put up a tough exterior, but no one falls in love with your people pleasing. That is not even lovable. What's lovable is your real self. And it's not crazy to think that it's not safe to be your real self when your real self still has a whole bunch of activated trauma and that every time you get your feelings hurt, maybe you lash out or you, you know, run away for three days. Yeah. You, it's not safe to show your real self. Then your healing has got to be like the place you start. You can't just say, I'll find a great relationship and then I'll heal. I do think that certain relationships have worked some magic on people from time to time, but I wouldn't bank on it. I would get to work on your healing right now. And just remember like the relationships you get into, you know, when love comes to town and you feel that mutual like thing coming up of, you know, <laughs> you're feeling that heart connection with somebody, that heart connection is always going to be built upon like where you are now in your healing and where they are. And there's going to be some kind of a match there that even makes it a viable relationship. So the more you kind of come up in your own healing, the more your heart is going to connect with people who are also kind of somewhere in that range. And that's what you want. That's what you want. You want to be getting together with people who are up here with you. And that's a very positive thing for your healing. When somebody does that, so you may have heard me talk before that one of the signs, if you're dating somebody and you're wondering like, is this the person I want to marry? One sign to look for is does their very presence in your life sort of call you up? Does it cause you to desire naturally to kind of just come up a level? That's a very good sign about somebody. And if you're like me, you know exactly what it's like to have the opposite, to be with somebody where it kind of like you start becoming your worst self and then you even go down another level. And next thing you know, it's like, you're like, this isn't even me. I don't even know how I got this way. And you have to leave the relationship to change. Well, conversely, there are people who are really good for you and you want to be ready for them and you get ready by doing your healing. All right. Seventh lie. You ready? I think you're going to like getting free of this one. It is the lie that tells you that you need to stay angry because if you're not angry, you will be defenseless in the world. You'll have nothing to protect you. Now, when I say that, and I tell you that I used to operate that way, I think it's easy to see like, well, that's a bad way to live your life. 
But ask yourself, in some way are you doing that? Are you holding on to the stuff that makes you mad? the resentment that you had, the identity of somebody who's very, very hurt. And I know you were very hurt. Like that is, that's not a lie. You were hurt. You were traumatized. It's not your fault. But are you letting that be your identity and holding on to it as if being angry and hurt is going to protect you from having it happen again? The irony of it is that when you're walking around identified as a person who's abused, it it does tend to happen again. It's a weird little magnet effect. It does tend to happen again. And it's a lot of work to start like growing your identity to, to, to something a little better than that, to somebody who has been hurt and who has healed the wound. That's a much better place to come from. And then you start to be oriented towards healing and you start making friends who are also real, like really into like healing and people who get it about you and they know what you've been through and they're really supportive of you. And you're in some situation where something is upsetting to you it's so good to have friends who are like, oh, I know this situation is hard for you. Let me hang out with you. I'll walk with you to the car. That's what you need. That's what you need. It's possible that in the future, you're not going to have to deal with these painful moments all by yourself. That through an iterative process of healing, a little here, a little here, a little here, you're going to start having more support in your life. All right. And you won't need your anger to protect you. You know what you're going to have? You're going to have friends, but even more importantly, you're going to have boundaries. <laughs> and they're this great alternative to anger and defensiveness. A boundary, I've been talking about that a lot in videos lately. So sometimes, naturally, CPTSD people get confused. We get confused because what is a boundary? And we think it's when we go, I need you to not talk about that topic because it triggers me. Okay, that's not a boundary. That is a demand. Now you can phrase it as a request, but what I want to clarify for you is what the boundary is, is that if you, if you ask somebody and say, I don't want you to talk about that. I don't want you to talk about that. I don't want you to talk about that, that your boundary is the point when you walk away from that person early in your recovery, you're going to have crazy boundaries. You're going to have like gorilla boundaries. They're just like, you know, here, 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 here. You can always tell somebody who's kind of early in the process. They're like putting up boundaries and the boundaries are a little bit, rough, right? They're a little bit hard on people. They're a little bit outsourcing responsibility to other people, but better you should err on that side than to have no boundaries. Like it's okay in your early recovery that it's a bit messy, that you're a bit ambitious. I would call that the adolescence of your healing when you're just, you know, oh, you're just getting free and you're just saying stuff and it's all, it's all positive. And if you stick with it, it'll start smoothing out to where you don't even have to tell people how they need to behave because you've actually learned to calm your triggers. Very rarely are you going to have to have an expectation of somebody else or a requirement that they be a certain way. You still get to do that, but it's going to be less often. You're not going to have to outsource that responsibility to them. You can relax. You can relax and you can hang out with people who maybe aren't the kind of people you would have hung out with before. I still have certain situations where I would never want to be in again. I don't want to be in a situation like I never again want to be in a car that feels out of control. Okay. That's a boundary. You know what my boundary is? Get out of the car. And I did that recently. I got out of the car. It was very upsetting to everybody, but the fact was never again do I want to be in a moving car totally afraid of the way somebody's driving. It's not, it's not something I'm going to let happen again if I can help it. What I had a hard time with in getting out of that car was doing it without doing an adolescent boundary of just like, blah, 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 you know, yelling about it. Um, so it wasn't very graceful at first, but I was able to wrap it up later. And the thing was, at least I got out of the car. At least I got out of the car. And sometimes that's what healing is. You know, the first order of business is to do the thing that is crucial for you to do. And you worry about kind of smoothing it out with everybody later. It's a good memory on top of a bad memory of just remembering like all the little moments when I got free enough to like take care of myself. All right. The last lie that I'm going to talk about in this video is, oh, and it's painful to say, this is a lie that presents itself as something very nice, but it's a lie. And it's that somebody will eventually come along and save you. Do you have that? Oh, I totally had it. And oh, that lie set me up for so much like grief and disappointment. I went through a lot of hard times when my kids were little. Their dad and I split up when they were very small. I didn't have enough money. Then I had all these medical problems and I really, really, really needed somebody to save me. And 
at one point I thought somebody had come along to save me and they, they, they were like, I'll save you, I'll take care of everything. And they turned out to actually be a very bad person. And I was vulnerable to that. That didn't work out. And in the pain that I had after that, I had to face this fact that actually not only was that person never going to save me and not only had, you know, my ex-husband not saved me, but that actually no one was ever going to come along and save me, that that was a fantasy. It was probably a projection of my like baby self waiting for a parent to come and pick me up. Who knows? I won't try to overanalyze it, but it was really hard to root out that, that fantasy. It was a pleasant fantasy. It was always like someday I'll have somebody I can talk to about everything that's happened to me. I mean, I really thought that, and I have this really nice marriage right now, but one of the painful adjustments when we were first married and in the early part of our relationship was that even though I had been through a lot of hard times and they were over, like talking about what happened always felt a little weird. Like it wasn't like the fantasy of like there, you know, it's all over now and it's never going to happen again. Like nothing he could say or do ever gave me that feeling. And I went through this rough patch where I was, I was angry and disappointed and kind of like the stages of grief. Like surely there's, surely there's some other option. There's something that he should say that would give me that feeling. And for me, the feeling ultimately came through my spirituality. And if you're a spiritual person, you may know what I'm talking about, that there are some things that if it didn't happen when you were a baby, like no human is ever going to be able to give that to you. They can give you a lot. I have a, this like lovely stable life with a man I love, but no one is saving me. And I developed a new vision of what that's like. So in addition to my faith, making me feel safe and knowing that, that ultimately I'm okay and I'm cared for and that all my troubles are known, that I'm not alone with them that also I have this safety and freedom in that I know how to deal with the harsh feelings that come up. And that is my wish for you, is that as you remove all of these lies from your consciousness about being no good and not belonging and needing to be angry and, and needing to be saved, that what's left after that is a peaceful confidence that no matter what happens, you're going to know what to do. You're going to know what to do. And these are the tools that I teach are the ones that will help you know what to do, that will help you deal with harsh emotions when they come up, how to, how to deal with it when you've gotten yourself into a situation where you've said something terrible and you want to back out of it and you want to apologize. These are the, thing, the things that I'm always teaching in the videos and in my courses. If you think you have CPTSD and you're not absolutely positive, you might want to take this quiz that I have. I, it's, it's a CPTSD quiz. It lists 20 symptoms, common symptoms, and you just check them off. It's not going to diagnose you, but you can check off and see if you have common symptoms. And if you do, if you resonate with this quiz, you are so in the right place. There is a way forward out of all this. I'm here to give you hope. It's actually very practical. Uh, I haven't talked about it so much in this video, but what CPTSD is at its root is it's a brain injury. And so a lot of the techniques I can show you, they teach you to calm your brain, heal your brain, get your brain regulated, and then all of a sudden you start to have choices. You can start to see your trauma-driven thinking and the lies that trauma tells you. You can see them for what they are. Your vision becomes clearer, and then you are more empowered to act because you have that confidence. If you love this topic about what healing feels like, I have this video that I love. It's right here. I want to make sure that you've seen it and share it with you, and I will see you very soon.